In this complex numbers question, we're gonna use some algebra and also some of the foundational results that we've proved about how complex numbers interact with each other uh, to provide an argument for some of the things that you can sort of see through visual intu intuition and through geometry, um, but we're gonna try and prove it in a rigorous way. So let's get tucked into this. You can see we've got 17 and 18 together because they kind of form one coherent whole. 17 says, show that for any non-zero complex number z, and they've written it in polar form, um, that part a, z times its conjugate equals uh, the modulus of z all squared. So there are, by the way, um, a part b and a part c to this question, but I'm only gonna focus on part a because um, that's the part that gets referred to in the next question. So let's have a go at this. Um, the first thing that I'm just going to flag, which seems a little bit unusual, is that uh, this question says, show that for any non-zero complex number. Um, so they're actually saying any complex number except for the origin. That's the only one we're excluding. We will come back to that point a little bit later on. Let's tuck into uh, this result that we're required to prove. Z times its conjugate equals uh, the modulus of Z all squared. Now, what they're doing is they're saying to us from the outset, uh, define this in polar form and then see what you can get from this, right? So I'm gonna say, if Z is equal to um, some modulus R times cos some angle theta plus I sine some angle theta, then by definition, the conjugate of Z is to take the imaginary part and flip it upside down. You know, if you were positive, make it negative. If you were negative, make it positive. So I would say, um, in this form, the modulus is unchanged, R stays the same, cos theta also stays the same because that's the real part, but here comes the imaginary part, it's minus I sine theta because I'm taking uh, the opposite sign. So now what happens when I multiply these two things together? Well, I would say Z times its conjugate, Z bar, equals, all right, well, let's, let's see what happens. I'm gonna be a little bit lazy and just multiply these uh, like so. So I think I'll just pop that over there. Uh, what happens here? Well, um, when we start to simplify this out, for starters, you can see uh, that you've got R and R just hanging out the front there. So I'll just write them as R squared. And then what you've got, if you look closely here, is you've got uh, something plus something and something minus something. This is kind of a difference of squares situation here, right? A plus B, A minus B. So I can just uh, factorize that as A squared minus B squared. So what do we get from that? Uh, cos squared theta, that's my A squared, then minus B squared. But in this case, we just have to be a little bit careful because the B includes the I and the sine theta. So therefore, B squared will be I squared sine squared theta. Okay, so there's my a squared minus b squared, um, but I know by definition that i squared is equal to negative one, so I'm getting cos squared theta plus sine squared theta, and by my handy dandy Pythagorean identity, I can say that that part is just equal to one. So there's r squared, but thinking back to what I was supposed to prove, um, r is the conjugate, sorry, is the modulus rather, of z, so this is just the right hand side that I was after, right? So I can just substitute that as uh, the modulus z squared as required. Okay, so that was not too arduous, that was 17 part a. And then 18 says, let z, it starts off in a very similar way, let z be any non-zero complex number. And now, as we read the next part of the question, we can see why they specify that this had to be non-zero. It says, by considering arg, of the absolute value of z or the modulus of z squared, use this result that we just proved um, to show that, uh, to prove that arg of the conjugate of z equals minus arg z. Okay, so take a breath for a second. What's going on? Why were they saying that we had to have not just any complex number, but a non-zero complex number? Well, it has to do with the fact that they um, asking us to prove a result um, using something to do with arguments, right? Now, arguments, we remember, are the angle starting from the positive real axis that we rotate upwards anti-clockwise um, until we are facing in the direction of our said complex number. Now, every complex number on the complex plane has a well-defined argument, um, except for one point, which is the origin, because if you wanna think about it this way, if I just draw a little complex plane here, and if I say, oh, uh, here is, uh, here's the origin, what is the angle at which you're facing to be pointed at that? Um, it, it doesn't make sense to pick any particular angle over any other. Um, you're always facing the origin if you're standing on it, right? So therefore we say um, arg 
zero is undefined. Uh, so that's why what they're doing is they're trying to say, well, look, let's just let's just take zero out of the running. Let's just not consider that as part of it. Um, and then let's think about the arguments of the rest of these. So this is question 18. When I want to think about um, arg of uh, the modulus of z squared, um, I can say since uh, you know the modulus of z squared, if I'm taking out the origin, right, then uh, this is just going to be, if you want to think about it this way, um, going back into rectangular form, it will we'll work it out as the square root of a squared plus b squared. A and B both being real numbers. Um, so what you're going to get here is going to be um, a positive number, right? It's going to be a positive number on the real number line. There's no imaginary pieces to our calculation of the modulus. And so I can say, especially because we've taken out zero, um, since the modulus of z squared, uh, I should say modulus of z all squared, it has to be a real positive number. Right, um, because uh, I'm, I'm excluding, I'm excluding zero. Right? Uh, maybe I should write that um, as z is not equal to zero. I can say therefore that the argument of the modulus of z squared um, is going to be. Think about this. Right? It's going to be somewhere on the real number axis and on the right hand side. But if we said that the argument is by definition the angle that you're facing at, starting from the real positive axis and rotating up, if you've got um, any number over here on the real axis on the positive side, the argument to all of these numbers is going to be zero. You don't have to rotate anywhere. This is your starting point, right? So therefore, I can say that argument is going to be zero. But from part A, um, I can substitute this for z times its conjugate, right? So I can say that not just the argument of the modulus of z squared, but the, mod, um, the argument of z times its conjugate, since those are the same, um, equals 0 to from part A. So what I'm doing is, just like I noticed that uh, these two things are equal, I can say that these two things are equal. That's me using part A. So now that I've gotten to this, where do I go? Well, um, as with all proof questions, what I'm going to try and do is keep in mind my destination uh, in order to work out how I should simplify uh, the current thing that I'm working on, right? Now you can see here's the destination. I need the argument of the conjugate of z separate to the argument of z. And at the moment, um, they're kind of tangled up together. Now at this point, what I have to do is use a result that I proved when introducing the polar form. One of the main reasons why we introduced polar form is because it helps us understand what happens to the arguments when you multiply two complex numbers together. So to remind you, uh, let's have a look at our proof of multiplication in polar form. We had to sort of do some uh, little work with trig identities here to say when you take two arbitrary complex numbers like um, R1, R2 times cos alpha plus I sine alpha, cos beta plus I sine beta, uh, what happens when you just expand that all out and then when you collect the, uh, the real and the imaginary parts, then you use the appropriate trig identities. We noticed that uh, the moduli get multiplied. That's not relevant to us at the moment. The arguments are what we're really interested in, and using these uh, tree expansions here, we notice that you add the arguments together if what you're doing is multiplying two complex numbers. So therefore, I can kind of do this in reverse. You can see I've got this uh, multiplication here, and so the argument um, of the, the product here is going to be the, the sum of the two arguments that I started with. That is arg of um, z plus arg of z bar. Um, if you like, just going back to our proof, um, that's like this is the first number and this z bar will be my second number, right? So that's why you can see I'm going to add these arguments together, which is what I'm doing here to get the argument of the product, right? So I haven't done anything to the right hand side, it's still zero. But we're pretty much there, aren't we? Can you see what I'm trying to do? I want to prove that uh, arg of the uh, conjugate of z equals minus arg z, but I'm only one line away from that. All I have to do is subtract this arg z from both sides. So I am going to do that. Arg of the conjugate of z equals minus arg of z as required. So that's the whole proof. And um, just to show you, just to bring it full circle, right? Um, what, what this actually means, if we are to draw, actually I'll do it this way. Um, if we draw ourselves a little complex plane here, 
bit messy, but you get the idea. If I had some arbitrary uh, complex number, z, so long as it's not on the origin, uh, and then I think about where is its conjugate going to be, well, um, the real part is going to be the same, so I'll still be on um, this same uh, vertical, sorry, the same horizontal coordinate, um, but I go from this vertical part here and I flip to the opposite side. So um, my z bar will be somewhere around here. So then when I think about, well, what direction am I facing in to be going up to that complex number versus going to this complex number, um, you can see, well, if this is theta, then this angle down here will be the same size but in the opposite direction, uh, which is to say the argument of the conjugate, which is this angle down here, is the same as going to the original number but minus. So instead of going up that way, I'm going to go down that way. Um, and you could probably look at this and say, oh, well, it, it must be true because visually it is the case. And um, what we've done is we've used our, um, our knowledge of complex numbers, how they're defined, um, and what happens when we put all of this arithmetic together to get our, our result here. So it doesn't just look like it's true, it absolutely can be proven.